I did a little survey, asked many, many people, and I got 100% of positive responses in the two areas of question which I asked them, which is, are people getting better? Are they getting nicer? And the overwhelming uh, answer was yes. And the second question was, are we better off financially? Well, and I asked each one of those people individually, and the answer was also yes. I mean, first people will start saying, ah, oh, no, the world is terrible, inflation, the prices of gas. I said, I'm not asking that. Are you better off your family? Are you better financially? And absolutely everyone is better off financially and people around them got nicer. So those are very, very positive, amazing things that was said to me overwhelmingly over the week. Now, obviously we also see how the evil, we keep on talking about that, how the evil is separating. So we can talk about it as a separate entity now. And the question that arise arose is um, obviously it's God who created evil and everything God creates has laws that it has to live by, grow by, exist by. Does evil have laws that it needs to abide by while it's still around? While it's still around. <laughs> oh, that's that's an important uh, little detail there because <clears throat> I think the biggest rule that evil has to abide by is that it's temporary it can't be forever it's a tool a means to an end and when the end is accomplished it's gone it has no right of existence on its own. Uh, it also cannot be overwhelmingly crippling. <clears throat> it has to leave room for freedom, for freedom of choice. So the evil cannot be a hundred percent. It can be tempting, it can be confusing, it can be, uh, it can appear to be urgent, but it can't be a hundred percent. Well, it's true of the good also. The good is a hundred percent good, but it cannot take away freedom of choice. So it has to be somewhat mysterious and hidden to allow for freedom of choice. The evil is never 100% to begin with. So it doesn't have to be hidden. Rabbi Friedman, but when, when evil, when we saw evil, when it was overwhelmingly bad and, you know, the worst example of evil, of course, is Holocaust. I don't want to say the best because it is the worst. And um, at least in the most recent times that we can see and uh, feel, still feel, um, it was overwhelmingly awful. It was overwhelming. There was no freedom of choice in that particular time for people who were dehumanized by other people who were ruled by evil. I don't know. <laughs> Very confusing. Sorry. Yeah, no. But history, recent history, has proved that it was not 100%. We, we, can, we can understand and we can even justify those who, who gave up, who quit, who capitulated. We can sympathize, we can empathize, we can even justify. But to say that they really had no choice? What about the people who chose to resist? I don't mean militarily. But those who grew stronger from it. <clears throat> those who stood up to it and had the uh, moral strength to, uh, to refuse, to be intimidated, 
So the fact that we're sitting here talking about Judaism shows that it was not 100%. It's not allowed to be 100%. And I think it's a perfect proof. Because if evil could be 100%, this would be it. Right? Can't imagine more evil than that. So it's like evil gave it the best shot. <laughs> yeah, that's coming. Also, quantitatively, you know, we survived the slavery in Egypt, which was a big miracle because Egypt was such a powerful country. But it was one country. Purim, we survived the threat that hung over 127 countries, the entire Persian Empire. Much more intimidating than one country. But it was one empire. It wasn't the whole world. The Holocaust, for all practical purposes, it was the whole world. The entire world was either actively engaged or passively engaged in the Holocaust. And even that, like the world gave it the best shot they had. Can't imagine anything more evil qualitatively and quantitatively. And yet here we are. They're lighting menorahs in Germany at the headquarters of the Nazi. Uh, so it's not a miracle that Judaism survives. It's like you say, the rule by which evil exists, you cannot be completely overwhelming. Rebbe Friedman, a lot of people comparing our times, I mean, obviously not um, fully, not, but somewhat to the times of Holocaust for two reasons, that people, freedoms are being taken away and some people feel like we're on a path to being dehumanized. I don't know if it's taking it too far or not, um, but um, people are realizing because of our times that there is uh, a lot of evil out there and the evil is, uh, you know, try, trying to rule the world um, periodically. Like, so people are kind of comparing our times to the times of Holocaust, but not obviously in all of its atrocities that have taken place. Um, would you agree with that? I don't think so. It's like children grew up with comic books, movies about the Nazis. And now these children are playing Nazis. It's like children playing the Nazi, you know. The, the circumstances today, whatever, whatever uh, the evil is doing, communism, fascism, whatever it is, it's like children masquerading like evil people. They're doing it only because they can. They really don't care. They're not ideologically evil. They're like children playing bad man, bad guys. You say boo and they'll run away. So any resistance, they're going to collapse. Right now they're having a free ride, having fun, which is all anybody wants these days anyway. So it's a dangerous game for kids to play. You can get really hurt, but you're talking about kids. You're talking about mindless people. So it's not it's not the same at all. N not that it isn't dangerous. And and the sooner it stops, the better. And there will be fewer people getting hurt and scarred from this game. But you can't compare. 
The evil today is the evil of ignorance, immaturity, and, and in permissiveness. They're just allowed and they feel entitled. So like spoiled children, they're doing whatever they feel like doing and having a great time. But they'll collapse in a second because there's no backbone. Um, Rabbi Friedman, I don't know if this is correct, but I learned somewhere that um, evil has to sort of give heads up on its plans. Um, sort of have to, I mean, is that one of the rules of the evil? Does it say anything about this in the Torah? I don't know if you're referring to the fact that before the evil can come into existence, the antidote has to be created first. So the antidote is already there, just waiting to um, detonate. <laughs> Look, uh, should we be intimidated by this evil man that is the president of the United States? I, is he a threat to the world? I don't think he is real. <laughs> doesn't doesn't look like he is the one. He looks like a little, you know, somebody has to be pulling his strings. Very hard to take him seriously. It's, it's sad to watch what's going on. So that's dangerous. But it's dangerous because of its weakness, not because of its power. <clears throat> it is so, it's so juvenile, it's so immature. Um, Rabbi Friedman, um, something amazing happened this week. I'd like to share it. I don't know, maybe you saw it yourself, but um, there was such a thing as um, Reawaken re re America Tour that took place in Dallas very recently. I think it actually just maybe ended yesterday or something like that. And uh, one of the people who was a speaker at this event, it was a huge event in a, in a stadium. And one of the speakers in that event was Dr. Zelenko. Dr. Zelenko is a Russian um, he's of Russian descent. He is an Orthodox. Um, I'm sure you know, but just for our audience, he is he is a doctor who is um, who has done a lot uh, during the COVID period. Became very famous. Um, um, believes that COVID has a cure. Came up with a cure. Uh, people used his cure. He cured a lot of people, and now he's uh, very vocal about the fact that there is a cure and there's no need to have such, such a hysteria going around. And um, and he is also a Lubavitch observant Jewish man. So it was amazing. I don't know if you saw this, but here's a huge stadium full of people, not Jewish people, people of all faiths, mostly not, mostly not Jewish. Um, and he comes on the stage and pretty much he starts to speak the Torah because everything that he speaks, he bases his um, intellect, knowledge on, on, on the knowledge of the Torah. And he used a lot of, uh, um, a lot of the Torah in his speech and people were whistling and clapping and giving him standing ovations. Everything he was saying, it was just hit home for most of the people there who, again, were not of the Jewish faith. And this is amazing. And I went back a little bit to what you're saying. That probably would not happen about a year ago or two years ago. And this is, um, this reminds me of our very, very first conversation we had on the radio about the three things that need to happen for Mashiach to, to come, which is Jews need to be, <laughs> need to, want to be Jewish, need to be proud to be Jewish. Other people need support to support them in that. And the world has to sustain itself. Um, this was about two years ago when we had this conversation. How would you assess the world in regards to the time we spoke about it then and now, in your opinion? 
It has, it has come to be. It's becoming rather obvious to everybody, which is exactly what needs to happen. <clears throat> yep, the world is turning to Judaism everywhere, thanks to the internet. I don't know what we would do without it. It came just in time. So there's so much, there's so much um, justification for optimism and, and real, op not just everything will be okay or God forbid, we'll go back to normal. <laughs> don't wanna, don't wanna do that because I'm not sure that was normal the way we were living before. But there's, there's real optimism of a world vastly improved the way God intended it. It's happening everywhere. More and more people are waking up to it. You know, we have this uh, chat online. It's open to everybody, particularly for people who support the, uh, pro the, the projects that I, I do. Last week, a guy came on. He is a native of New Guinea. And in order to come online to hear the conversation, which is basically Torah, he had to walk eight hours from his jungle village to where there's internet. Now he's going to walk back eight hours to share what he learned with his community. If that's not the fulfillment of the ultimate prophecy, that in the end of days, the world, the nations of the world, will come to the Jewish people and say, House of Jacob, lead the way and we will follow in the path of God. So in very simple language, people want to know what God expects of them. And the only way they're going to find out is by asking Jews. It's exactly what's happening even if you have to walk eight hours. The other people on the chat were so inspired. People were crying. They couldn't believe it. So they immediately said, we'll buy you a bicycle. We'll ship it over. We'll get you a bike, you know, with big tires. He said, there's no way a bicycle can, can uh, make, make it through the jungle paths. So the bicycle would not help at all. Eight hours of walking plus breaks has to rest. So it's 11 hours, 11 hours each way. And what is it? They just need to know what the Torah says in the jungles of New Guinea. It is awesome. Rebbe Friedman, Rebbe Friedman. I was one of was those one people of those crying. People <laughs> I heard that. That was that blew me away as well. So uh, amazing. Um, the thing is that uh, we see it now in the very innocent places, in the places that have not been um, exposed to corruption. It seems like um, the more I don't even know how to call the places, you know, where everything is available, everything is accessible, money is no object, and um, values started to decline majorly due to that. Um, it seems like these places, like New Guinea, even though there's no internet there <laughs> and people have to travel for 11 hours to get to the internet, they, they do but in the places which are so accessible and so easily, um, you know, where we can just click a button in, in our phone in any place uh, we are and get the information. This is where people are still not reaching out. 
what will it take to reach out for these people to reach out to Torah? Some good news. If those people who are making all the bad news <clears throat> would suddenly announce that they have had a change of heart and that they are ready to become good, everyone will become good. So we certainly don't need any dire consequences. We don't need horrible things, God forbid, to happen. All we need is for people to say, ooh, I'm being really, I'm being really stupid. And enough of this, that's all. That's all it'll take. So the evil of today is like a big balloon full of hot air. And if somebody just puts a pin through it, it's over. And the solution is already available. The internet is full of wisdom, full of classes, teachers, instructions, everything is there. All we need is an interest. So those who are not yet interested, they will be. Because when the balloon bursts, there will be only one alternative, the truth. It's so exciting. Reverend Friedman, it is exciting, but we have to learn from our mistakes. And of course, I can't help but still go back to the question is, how, we were also in one of our conversations, we were saying, you were saying that in general, people are good. In general, people are good. So the question is, why do good people do bad things? How did we get here? So this, this is this is a major distinction. <clears throat> In the past, people did bad things because they were really bad people. They were truly evil, determined to be destructive, determined to cause pain, determined to bring everybody else to their knees. And they were willing to die to do that. Today, we don't have that. People are not that determined. They're not that evil. They're not that powerful. And they're not willing to even suffer a paper cut for what they believe in. So as long as they're making money, they're going to be happy and they're going to continue. As soon as it starts to become a negative, like saying, there's a whole there's a whole structure to the unholiness, to the corruption, to the greed. There are too many people. If you want to be a gang of bandits, you got to limit the members because every additional member is a danger. So if you have a really big gang, you're in trouble. You need a few dedicated people willing to risk their lives. Then you got a powerful gang. But if you have thousands of people, oh, you're in danger. So imagine one person gets turned off in that group, in that swamp. One person gets turned off and says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to reveal it all, one person, and the whole thing will collapse. It's like in the grocery store, you know, you have the uh, heads, the lettuce piled in these big piles, <laughs> pull out the bottom one, and it'll all come tumbling down. So any one of them gets a little disillusioned and a little offended, it's all over. Not the way it used to be. People are not willing to, to put their life on the line for their own evil intentions. And if you're not willing to put your life on the line, then as soon as it becomes embarrassing, you're just going to run and hide. 
So the worst thing we can do today is to be intimidated by the evil. It's a bunch of kids sitting around without adult supervision playing with matches. Is it dangerous? Very dangerous. But, do we need to run and hide? No. But why do we call them good anyway? Some. Some of them. They could be good people. They were never taught, never inspired, never encouraged, too spoiled to even see past their own nose. It's not the same as evil people. It's good people being really, really reckless and stupid. So the question, why do good, good people do bad things? Today, it's not because the evil is so compelling. It's because they're bored and spoiled and think they can get away with anything. So they're having a blast. Literally like a bunch of teenagers that have the house to themselves. <laughs> that, that is a very good metaphor because they do have the house to themselves. <laughs> the Congress and the Senate. <laughs> well, hopefully not for long is what I wanted to um, bring, come back to. We always said that the root of all evil is um, not money, but my money. This is your words, and they were very, very uh, profound. So my question is, um, that has not gone away, even though people have maybe um, evolved uh, or uh, are evolving, maybe they're seeing the truth, but that aspect of money, wanting money, needing money, and still kind of measuring everything with money is still there. Is that something that needs to change in order for the world to um, get to the next level and to become really better? For sure. It does need to change, but it already is changing. Like when you said you asked people about their finances, and you had to, you had to guide their thinking because they weren't focused on their own finances. So they, they were making, they were making money. They had money. They didn't realize it until you pointed it out to them. Like, what is that? It's, it's absolutely Although true. inflation yeah. is terrible. Do you have money? Yeah. <laughs> You're not sitting and counting the dollars like screw, like a miser, obviously, because your, your focus was not on your money. So it's almost like we didn't expect to make this money. We didn't expect to have this money. So it's like, uh, I don't know, a gift. It's not that same greedy ownership. You know? I've got to own my money. No, the money comes. It's there. It's available. Yeah, we're doing good. It's, it's beautiful to watch this. But it's still... And that's why people are so much more generous now. You know, I traveled for the last two weeks over Hanukkah. I was in seven different cities, a bunch of different Chabad houses, and they're all doing well on donations. So it's not just that people have what to live on. People have money to give, and they're giving more than ever. It, 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 there's no explanation. Rabbi Friedman, but there is still this mentality to want more, uh, need more, um, strive for more, and I'm talking about money, of course, that has not gone away, even though that maybe people, people's morals, mentality is changing, people are growing up, but that aspect is so drilled within our, I don't know, this is our period of time that we're living in. Has it always been, I mean, money has always been important, but has it 
always been this important and this much of a priority? That may be the last thing to go in the improvement of the world. But on the other hand, we don't want it to disappear. We don't want a world in which people don't care about money. That would be that would be very uh, retrograde. That would be going backwards. Now that the world is wealthy and now that the world has money, we don't want to go back to poverty. We don't want to go back to uh, you know, what people call simple life. Let's go back to the simple life when we had nothing. No, thank you. Don't be ridiculous. No, we need more money, not less. But we need to be the masters of our ship, not the slave to our ship. And that's what needs to happen. We need to have more and more money and care less and less about it. But don't give up the money. Don't know. There's nothing virtuous about poverty. Poverty, no, but is is simplicity really equals to poverty? No, what I'm saying is you can't lose interest in money. You have to change your opinion of it, your perspective, but not be interested in money. What, what, what's, what's good about that? No, it's the same as celibacy. There is no virtue in celibacy, none. Of course, we got to get our sexuality under control. That's a different story. So it's the same idea. Don't lose interest in sex. Just treat it with the respect that it deserves so that it serves the purpose that it's supposed to serve and don't become a slave to it. So you don't want to be a sex addict because then you're not enjoying it. And you don't want to be addicted to money because then you're not enjoying the money. So, of course, we want a healthy attitude towards money. But not a loss of interest. Rabbi Friedman, what is the right attitude towards money? Not the Hollywood attitude that we've been conditioned to accept in the last, I don't know, what, 50, 60, 100 years, I don't know. <laughs> Money basically means wealth. Wealth, affluence, means no concerns, no worries about survival. No worries about comfort. We have everything we can possibly need. Now, let's do something important. That, that's, the, that's the world we want to see. A world in which there's no concern for money because everybody has it. Then there will never be a concern. There's no, there's no jealousy, greed, or am, ambition to make more money because you have the money you need. So it's, I guess it's a, it's a reverse uh, picture from communism or socialism. We don't want a world in which nobody has equally, so there'll be no jealousy, there'll be no crime because there's nothing to steal. No thank you. There's no reason that people can't have everything they need to be completely comfortable and therefore not jealous of anybody else. So communism is, is functions under the assumption that there's not enough to go around. If there's not enough to go around, and some people will have more, some people will have less, that will create an inequality in the society. People will be jealous of the haves because they are the have-nots, and then there's going to be crime because the have-nots are going to steal from the haves. But it's all based on one silly assumption. We can't all be rich. And it's, it's a silly assumption. It's ridiculous. The earth can give us so much wealth 
that there's no reason that everybody, everybody in the world can be, to use a, a vulgar expression, filthy rich. So instead of praying for, for, for a universal poverty, we should be praying for a universal filthy rich. Um, Robert Friedman, you're right. The problem is not that people don't have the money, is is that the money are disproportionate, and um, and, and I, that this panic. Okay. Is it going to be like this forever? The rich will be rich and the poor will be poor. Come on, that's not acceptable. So you're right. Make the poor rich. But communism wants to make the rich poor. And it all comes from that silly attitude that there will never be enough for everybody. And that's intimidating. That's how you scare people into, into behaving and into following and into accepting your dictatorships. We're not scared. There's enough for everyone to be richer than they need to be. So let's go for it. And the proof of it, the proof of it is what's going on today. No jobs, no, no, no work, no freedom, no, but everybody's got money to give away. And not everybody, but it's getting, we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, I'm into that, but um, so far it seems, seems a little bit virtual. I mean, unreal. It, it, it doesn't make sense. Hopefully, soon it will start to make sense. Well, that's that's when communism will really be defeated. <laughs> you get to the heart of it. That principle, there isn't enough for everybody. When that goes, then communism is really gone forever. If you enjoyed this conversation or this topic and you're looking for more information or you want to hear it again from another angle, there is a way to do that. And that is in this book. It's all there. Order it from Amazon. You can read it, reread it and share it. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal. It's questions and answers, it's conversation. It's really relaxed, it's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program. There's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us, take a look, click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best and join us for some enjoyable conversation.